Welcome back to Backcountry BSing, the, well, the official podcast of Shill Brothers Outdoors. Yep. Another fun one for your lockdown experience. Yep. Um, we've been trying to talk to Plug It In Hikes for a long time, and now that coronavirus is still going on, people have nothing better to do. Yeah, I know. And if so we not, got him. Yeah, if you're not familiar with Plug It In Hikes, he's in all of, he's in all the videos, all the YouTubes. Yeah, he's in a, he's he hikes with a lot of famous YouTubers. He has a YouTube channel. He has a really good Instagram. Yep, and, um, um, and he's a good website. And done done just a awesome awesome array of trails from the Highline Trail to yes. the JMT. Yeah, I forgot he's, he's, he's done all the Smoky Mountain stuff. It's just uh, excellent excellent uh person to talk to about just hiking in general so let's bring him in let's do it so sir thank you thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us um we've been we've been wanting to talk to you for a long time you go to a lot of very cool places to (laughs) hike you do (laughs) we're very jealous of that and uh you have a really nice studio too um so because it's this current thing is going on the first thing we kind of ask people is how how's it going with the whole pandemic thing you still safe because you're in tennessee right yep we're in east tennessee just outside of knoxville okay so is how has that area been faring you know it's actually not too bad for the most part most people are kind of heeding you know everybody's recommendations but you know you know you have those few out there that just don't care or whatever Mm -hmm. um for those, I mean, you have to kind of deal with that a little bit. Yeah. You know, which, which is, it is what it is. Right. Yeah. You know? it, so in Ohio, they're still allowing, because I know the Smokies is shut down. Um, in Ohio, mm-hmm. the national forests are still open for dispersed camping. What is, what is, what are they allowing you to do in Tennessee? Well, the Smokies just opened back up. Oh, they are like open. On a limited, yeah, but it's kind of like limited. Your most popular trails are closed. Uh, they're limiting how many people can stay at per- certain campsites, certain shelters, things like that. And honestly, I don't, even, I don't even know if the shelters are even open. Yeah. Uh, I just know that some of the trails are definitely closed. The state park is running on the same kind of deal. They're back open pretty much, you know, suggesting, you know, social distancing and things of that nature. So some state parks aren't open just cause those areas are like very concentrated okay. and you have to be on top of each other. But for the most part, most of the parks are open. I haven't actually been out. Uh, I've uh, kind of elected just to kind of hang out here at the house. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe ride my mountain bike a little bit here locally uh, just off to myself or just spend time here in my gym. And this is actually my gym area. You have a nice. sweet gym. I see doubles, some, yeah. yeah <laughs> that doubles as my, my studio. So I, I keep tape on the, on my rubber flooring to where I can set up all my stands. Oh, yeah. Nice. 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 So everything goes together pretty quick. Um, so, so after, after this lockdown, what are there any big plans this year or have they all been kind of pushed back or changed or everything has been put on hold basically. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, you know, I had plans on actually hiking last week up in Pennsylvania mm-hmm. for LH, LHX 2020, where we were raising money for reboot recovery and, and uh, mission 22 that got scrapped. And then we were looking at maybe doing Portugal in june obviously that got scrapped yeah and right now corsica which is september yeah looking at the gr20 uh right now that is on hold right kind of like in a holding pattern to see what else happens but honestly i don't expect things to open back up in time for us to even do that one yeah Uh, so my focus for this year is simply just focus on me yeah you know i'm always out just hiking everywhere and doing this and doing that and you know i've taken a break from youtube for a little bit and it's just at a point to where okay maybe this is a sign that i need to slow it down just a little bit i start working on me work on focus on my health mental health everything and and just try to um i don't know maybe just 
level out a little bit. I, it's the time yeah. to do it. And and that's, we've heard yeah. a lot of people talk about that. And, 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 you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of things have come out through the lockdown and a lot of learnings about like who you are and, and, yeah. and, and what, what things are most important to you and, and what, and how you want to take advantage of the, of this type of environment to, to better yourself. And so, yeah, I, I've, yeah, I've, yeah, I think it's fantastic. This is the time to do that. Um, so I actually want to talk about, I want to go back in time here because we always talk to our guests about this, but we talk to us because it's, how did you get into backpacking? Well, it was actually, whenever I was younger, I used to backpack a lot. My grandparents live at the edge of the Cumberland Plateau in a very rural area. So they live along the, when I say edge, I mean edge, like there was a cliff line that oh, laced geez. their property. So you could look out over the Tennessee Valley and see the Smokies, see the Appalachian Mountains on a, you know, a low humidity day. And I remember just as a kid, you know, here we are just cutting in little trails to different rock outcrops, you know, that me and my cousins would call them lookouts. We we had limited vocabulary, apparently, because it was lookout one, lookout two, <laughs> lookout three. But we cut in trails to all these locations. And, you know, just growing up there, pretty much really just kind of like started planting seeds in me. Uh, my senior year, Instead of going to Panama City like everybody else was, I went to Big South Fork and backpacked. That's awesome. You know, and, you know, in my early 20s, I did that, you know, did some backpacking, but I kind of got away from that once I started doing rescue work. It just required so much of my time. And I didn't get back into backpacking until about 2015. And it was actually Will Wood's um, video series on the AT that really just sucked oh, me really? back in. Oh, really? Wow. Red beard. Yeah, I, I remember sitting on my on my bed just binge watching all that that whole series and never once in my mind did I ever think, man, maybe someday we'll be friends or maybe someday we'll do a lot of epic hikes together or someday we'll be in the film together mm-hmm. or, you know, just all those variables, you know, like, you know, I would be friends with the z Packs guys too none of that ever like seemed remotely possible. You know, what I didn't realize is the backpacking community is actually really small. And it's really easy to communicate, you know, laterally yeah. everywhere, you know, you can, you can pretty much connect with anybody. So that was really cool. And, you know, here we are today, you know, years down the road with a little bit of backpacking experience under our belt. And uh, little did I know how instrumental backpacking would be as far as a healing process for me mm-hmm. personally and, uh, and how many doors that would actually open. How did, um, how did you get hooked up with those guys initially? You know, I just, you know, started just communicating on social media with them and went to trail days, met them one time. And next thing I knew, all the trail days after that, I was helping them in the booth. Okay. Stay, staying with them there, you know, and just connecting. And next thing I knew after that, I was going to the shop, you know, hanging out down there a couple of times a year. Um, now, you know, I'll still do that. I'll still go down. But this time, you know, I'm going down about three or four or five times a year. I'll stay with my buddy, Matt. Uh, uh, details. Details. Yeah. I'll stay with him. And uh, I have a guest bedroom there. I, I tell him to <laughs> drop me off on his taxes. So, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, uh, good people, you know, just, just really connect. I've got to know all of, all of Matt's family and, and, um, uh, a lot of different people down there that works for Z-Packs. So I've gotten to know a lot of the employees and, you know, and that really is to, for me, I think is even, even more cool is, not only is some of the other companies that sponsor me and different things like that, but you know, with companies like ZPAX, I know some of the employees. So I know the people that are actually making the gear that mm-hmm. I use. Yeah. You know, it's like with goose feet gear. I know Ben and, and his wife, Ashley. I mean, they're good people. I know who's making my gear. Same for Evan over at black rock gear and Rex. I know who's making my gear. And that's for me, that's just way cool. And, uh, I know whenever I go to purchase more gear, or whatever, I know who I'm supporting. I know, you know, I know I'm helping, you know, individuals. I'm just not, just not thinking about helping 
some foreign company, yeah. you know, way out there uh, doing whatever. You know, so I, I like kind of not necessarily keeping it local, but in a way it, it is keeping it like here in the United States. Yeah, and we, we certainly echo that as well. And we've we've had we've we've been fortunate enough to talk to a lot of cottage cottage manufacturers. Yeah, and I was gonna ask you how you because I always see you repping and we're huge fans of Black Rock gear. We're huge fans of everyone you just mentioned, but you're always rocking the woolly from Black Rock gear and I love that yeah. thing. How did you how did you meet them? Well, you know, crazy enough, I've never actually met them face to face. You know, I was just a longtime customer. Yeah. And whenever I did the Smokies 900 mile or the FKTs that I did there in the Smokies, that kind of put me on the map and, um, you know, just kind of made a lot of people aware of me. And I just reached, you know, I reached out to Rex one time and, and Evan and said, hey, you know, I'm thinking about doing this next 900 miler and I plan on going faster and doing it in less days. I uh, wonder if you guys would, you know, want to sponsor me or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, yeah. So they hooked me up with, you know, another down beanie and, and the woolly and stuff like that. And I think Evan got tired of seeing me because at the time I was wearing this Patagonia uh -huh. <laughs> um, Capoline beanie or something like that. Yeah. This is before he came out with the woolly. And uh, so he had seen me rocking that thing all the time. And uh, next thing I knew, I had that in the mail waiting on me. I tried this on for a while. So I tried that and it worked out great and I fell in love with it. And then the Scully came out. Mm. Uh, the Scully, he made, sent it to me, the prototype and said, test it out, see what you think. You know, let me, let me know if you think this is something that would sell. And I tried it on and wore it like for weeks and like maybe a couple months. And I just fell in love with that one because no matter if it was like super hot or whatever, it still worked out. You know, it still helped uh, keep sweat out of my eyes and yeah. different things like that. So it was cool to help that product come to, you know, come to the table, I guess, uh, get, you know, bought by everybody, I guess. But yeah, that was really cool. And, you know, just the way that I try to help my sponsors out, you know, way I'm always trying to just keep people aware that, hey, they're, they're here. You know, and these are small businesses. These aren't people that are out here like living in big extravagant houses right. or anything of that nature. You know, these aren't big businesses. These are little guys. They have families. You mm -hmm. know, they're going to soccer games. They're going to baseball games and different things like that. So it kind of, for me, it, it became more important for me to like just kind of help those people out. So every time they would run a sale, I would share that. Mm -hmm. Or if they would give me a promo code, I would I would push that and try to help give them a little more business. And, but I, I couldn't ask for, for better, better people. I know um, Evan has invited me up to hang out with him for, for a few days. Um, this was way back before the COVID deal kicked mm -hmm. in. So I'm just kind of waiting to give that some time and we may make a run to Seattle. That's right. I've that's where they there. are. Yeah, <laughs> I forgot that's where they are. Yeah. And that woolly I think is, I wear it running. I wear it backpacking. I wear it yeah. for a lot of stuff. It's really good. Um, well, so yeah, hold on. You mentioned what what FKTs did do you own right now? Like, do you still well, or did did yeah, somebody I'm, overtake I'm, any of them? No, I'm no. Nice. I'm still the current holder. Um, okay, the Smokies 900 miler is basically whenever you hike all the trails in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park mm -hmm. boundary. Uh, you become part of the club, per se, the 900 miler. Now, there's only 803 miles of trail in the park, but there used to be 900 miles. Just over the years, the park decommissioned mm. trails and things of that nature, but they kept the trail, you know, the thing the same way. Um, the Smoky Mountain 900 Club, 900 miler club, is the ones who govern this. So the park has uh, nothing to do with okay. it. It's all about this one club. And, um, I just kind of stumbled across it, you know, in 2017, the winter of 2017, I did all the trails in the park in the fastest known time, which was 78 days. And I did them in the most efficient manner, which was 944 miles at the time. Right. Now wow. at that time, there were also a handful of trails that were closed from the recent Smokies fires. 
I took that information, and that was kind of funny because I didn't even intend to do an FKT. That one, I was just wanted to get them done so I could get back to work. <laughs> and the first month, I was working three days a week, so I wasn't hiking three days a week during that whole deal. So mm. at the end, it wasn't until the end until I decided that, that I found out an FKT existed. And I'm like, heck, okay, I'll do it. And uh, at the end of this thing, it was just so crazy. I mean, all these people were there at the finish because nice. uh, we do like one of the things about the 900 Miler Club, you line people up in two rows to get their trekking poles and you have a <laughs> tunnel. So you go through the tunnel, you know, to your trailhead to the last one. And um, there were so many people there. I mean, there were probably like 50 yards or longer people and because they'd been advertised on tv someone found out i was finishing you know at a, at a designated time at a designated location so all these people were showing up to be a part of this uh because it was like all over the news all three news channels were talking about it i was on the front page of Knox news and it was like psychotic and honestly it's a little bit embarrassing because that's not it didn't yeah. even resemble right, an FKT, right, yeah. you know? So I was like, uh, yeah. I mean, it was one of those things I couldn't even go to the grocery store without someone recognizing oh, me, nice. you know? So it was it was kind of crazy. So I decided the following fall of 2017, I was actually going to do an FKT and show everybody what that's supposed to look like. So I took my trail data. I had a friend that had a program uh, that he borrowed from one of the government labs. I can't say which or where, <laughs> but he had a program. He over he put in the parks digital data for the trails. Then he overlapped that with my trail data. And that computer system told him which, you know, where I was hiking too much. You know, my routes, oh, how I can make my routes more efficient. So I went cool. from 78 days to 43 days. Wow. Oh, wow. And... I did, uh, instead of 944 miles, I even dropped it down to 924. And and that is even after the park even opened up some of those trails that were originally closed. So I was able to go quite a bit more efficient. And that's how I got it. So my official time is 43 days, 924 miles. And actually, I have a couple of friends that are set to attempt to break that this fall, I hope, if COVID lifts. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a funny story. I was actually going to go back and do it this spring and they had reached out to me to see if I, I would let them do it. Cause they want to raise some money for the parks rescue team. Mm -hmm. And yeah. obviously, you know, I have rescue experience. And, uh, so I was like, sure, go ahead. You know, I'm all about it. And I think their plan is to try to break my record in a few days by a few days. Uh, I would like to come back in the following March, so maybe this time next year. Actually, I prefer February, but uh, maybe do that in thirty-ish days. So what I would like to do when when you did the when you did that record attempt, were you also working on at the, at the same time as well? No, that no, that last one I took time off from work, so I told all my customers, "You're gonna have to wait." Yeah, you know, I'm doing this. As soon as I'm done, I'll get to you. And everybody was like very gracious and willing to wait. So that that worked out for me, I suppose. I'm sure some customers went somewhere else, but <laughs> that's bound to happen. Yeah. And and then with with that type of, I can only imagine the logistical challenge and of, I, of and trying to figure out the routes. I, I'm there. trying to I tried to do the math in my head while you were talking of the average daily mileage. That's like forty or fifty miles a day, right? No, the wow. average mileage for that hike was 20, 22 oh, wow. miles a day, somewhere in that neighborhood. Okay. So was it wasn't too off. bad. Um, but for 40. That wasn't, that wasn't what I did every day. There were days that I did eight miles. There was a day I did 10 miles. Uh, I know there at the end, there was a few days like Thanksgiving, and the day after Thanksgiving that I, you know, I made very short days because I had family and friends that wanted to hike mm. with me on this particular hike and nobody could do thirties. <laughs> so I did tens those days. So that I left a lot on the table. I started out actually that hike. I didn't even train going into it because I had plantar fasciitis really bad. So I went from the couch to the trail like oh, wow. overnight. Jeez. Yeah. So, so my first 
few weeks, my first two or three weeks, I was only doing like maybe 15 miles a day mm -hmm. uh, in an enormous amount of pain each yeah. day. Uh, but my max mileage, you know, in that process of trying to make up some of those mileages, you know, I did 35 miles uh, in the 30s quite a few times there just to kind of make some of that extra mileage back up towards mid and late hike. What's the, uh, and I want to go back to what you said, how hard was the logistics of, of doing that with like resupplies and all that sort of stuff? Resupplies wasn't too bad. I kept a lot of supplies in my truck. So I would make sure that I had pretty much everything set. Occasionally I would go into Cherokee and get some fresh veggies or something like that or some milk. Kind of crazy when I'm on trail, I really crave milk bad. <laughs> yeah. um, or at least I used to. And uh, so I would just want to get like fresh foods and things mm -hmm. of that nature. Sometimes I would just sleep in my truck in the parking lot of the IGA there in Cherokee. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would just wake up next morning, get back to the trail before daylight and get started again. So this is kind of like a geek question. You, wh wh How many like calories were you consuming during that per day? Did you, did you, during that, uh, during that time I was doing, cause I wasn't really pushing big, big mileage. Right. I mean, there was, there was probably a few handful of times I was doing thirties plus those days I'd eat a little bit more, but on average I was taking in four or 5,000 calories nice. okay. somewhere in that neighborhood. Yeah. I just try to eat as much fatty foods as I could and some proteins and, uh, some carbs where I need them. Yeah. What's like your, like what are you eating the most of when you go out there? I eat a lot of almond butter. Okay. You know, I'll, I'll have almond butter. I'll have, um, you know, maybe some tortillas, some wheat tortillas. I try to eat as clean as I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, obviously, back then when I was doing that, um, Evergreen Adventure Foods wasn't around or any, anything like that. My friends Toast and Jams hadn't created that company yet. So my food options, you know, were just, you know, your typical backpacking food. And I really didn't want that. Yeah. You know, I wanted something more healthier for me yeah. than just junk. Mm -hmm, for sure. And unfortunately, a lot of your backpacking foods is just mm -hmm. junk. I mean, they, they pass it off as good, but at the end of the day, you're still dealing with just, you know, lots of just stuff that's in there that's really not really good for you to, to consume day in and day out. Right. Weekends, sure. Yeah. You know, it's not going to hurt you. But when you're out there 30, 43 days, let's say, you know, you don't want that stuff to build up in your system too much. Yeah, we um we we had a we did a podcast with a dietitian two weeks ago, week and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And um she's she is she was a clinical dietitian and now she's gotten into backpacking and backpacking food. We talked a lot about how like your typical backpacking food is is generally just crap. It's just carbs and sugar. It's just like yeah. it's like highly you know what I mean? It's yeah, it's carbs and sugar and it's it's obviously not fresh and her whole thing is, you know, how can we fix that? And that's why Andy and I actually we started to do a lot of our own dehydrating over the last couple of years mm -hmm. because we kinda got fed up. There's just only so many times you can have like chili mac from Mountain House. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah. Pasta sides. But, exactly. yes, there's only so many pasta sides you can get before it just starts to get repetitive. And I can't imagine doing it. For 40 some days. Yeah. yeah, that would just be insane. And that's why I try to get into town, you know, when I could, which was usually about once a week, to just try to get something fresh. Yeah. And then luckily I had a lot of friends that would come in and bring me stuff. Um, a few times friends would bring me coffee. I, I really appreciate that because uh, I don't cook on the trail typically, uh, especially when you're doing something like that. You yeah. want to travel as light as you can. And, um, so that worked out a lot. And, you know, at the end, uh, I had my pizza and beer celebration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the, fa one of the, the best things I liked about, like, uh, I watched, I watched all of your, um, your JMT videos last year. And I thought it was yeah. absolutely hilarious how every time you pick up a resupply, you had also a supply of Yeehaw beers for all your <laughs> summit beers, which was awesome. Yeah. I actually. <laughs> did a video and that's kind of funny that whole yeehaw deal uh i had some friends that worked for yeehaw at the time and we were actually working on a sponsorship with them oh nice so they hooked me up with all kinds of gear and <laughs> all kinds of beer too so with the jmt i shipped a bunch out there and uh 
to take with me as I'm on the trail every once in a while. And it just hit me at, you know, I took one up Mount Whitney. I didn't drink it because the trail was really icy. Trails Crest was like super iced. And it's, you know, you got some spots there that are mm-hmm. yeah. pretty close to a thousand foot drop. Yeah. You know, not really something you want to be like halfway drunk on. <laughs> and I've been told, you know, that one beer equals like four at elevation. Oh, yeah, there. That's a good point. Yeah. I had no idea how any of that would affect me. So I was like scared like a little schoolgirl about, you know, drinking anything up there on top. So I took it with me, took some pictures, got to the bottom, back to Guitar Lake chugged that baby and uh it was hot and i hadn't figured out how to like keep my beer cold yet so as i started you know northbound i I would have like one or two here with me i kind of figured out take a ziploc baggie you're always coming across a patch of snow right oh nice before you get to pass so throw in a snow nice you know one can and with that low humidity it would chill that beer down within you know, a few minutes. Oh, nice. So I remember getting to these passes and just, it was not, it was a nice treat, number one, but it was like a mini celebration. Yeah. So you just pop that top and, and just chug it. And I actually recorded all those and made like a little small video called Beer Pass. <laughs> uh, it was as obnoxious as you could imagine it probably was. I would go up there, I would chug it, I would speak with attitude, uh, I would. I would belch into the camera. Like, oh my bring God. It, in close. it was just horrible. So I finally, I just made that on private. I was like, Ugh. Oh, nice. Man, that was just too bad. That's that funny. I, I was, I was, we pre- need to bring more summit beers. <laughs> I was, we don't have we don't I was, summits. <laughs> I was surprised too. like the thing that intrigued me the most was that you, did you ship all that out there? You shipped beers out in a, yeah. okay. That's, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. I actually only did one shipment. I shipped to MTR. Uh, and so I shipped a couple of beers into that one, but, uh, Chad sticks blog, uh, Chad and I drove out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we actually hand dropped, hand delivered our one drop off uh, at okay. Red's Meadow. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that, that was the advantage. And I was able to start off with a couple of beers, you know, cause he had his car out there, but anybody, you know, through hiking the JMT, I would honestly, um, I wouldn't even recommend resupplying at Red's Meadow. You can take a couple reasons. You can actually take a bus for like seven bucks down the Mammoth and back. So you can go into town, oh. get fresh food, and come back for seven dollars. Yeah. You can be able to eat, drink, whatever you want to do, right. or even stay at a hostel like Holiday Hostel or something like that for like 40 bucks. So it's a great trail town. You can travel all over town on the trolley system for free. So once you're in town, you can go anywhere. You really don't have to walk if you don't want to. But I really like that. But the one thing that I didn't like is that Red's Meadow, they don't have a hiker box. Mm -hmm. So if you called and said, hey, I'm not going to be hiking through, just put that in a hiker box. They just give it to their employees. They don't put it in a hiker box. And they actually had told me that. And it really upset me because, you know, I understand they're trying to, You know, they got business and they're trying to sell food and trying to sell stuff and things like that. But I mean, sometimes if you show a little kindness and show hikers that you're trying to help them out as much as you can, you know, they they would probably tend to like buy stuff that they didn't pack in, you know, that they didn't ship. So my stuff, I'd already went in the mammoth and got fresh food. So all my stuff I had shipped, I actually opened up the box on a picnic table, grabbed a Sharpie, put on their hiker box. Oh. And solicited other hikers said, Hey, you need some ramen? Hey, you need oh. some soup or whatever. Just started handing stuff out like so, Santa Claus. So the reason <laughs> the reason for not having the hiker box was that they were worried that it would take sales away from like their general store or their, that's uh, weird. Yeah. That is weird. Yeah. That's, now that's there's a supportive. hiker box at the little campground nearby, mm-hmm. but they won't take anything over there to that, you know. I know I know for certain you know, I had one employee tell me that, you know, we just give it back to our, we just give it to our employees or if it's something that can be sold, we'll put it on chill. Wow. Well, uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's weird. Um, okay. <laughs> I feel like with all this hiking you've done there and the Smokies, you've got to have some good bear stories. Actually, on both 900 milers, I've only seen one. Bear no way. In the Smokies? <laughs> really? Yeah. 
believe it or not. That surprises me. Yeah, it does. That, now, I've seen more wild hog than I did anything, and those those are the things you have to worry about. Bears, they're going to leave you alone. Right. They could care less. They want no part of you. But wild hogs. Wait, hold on. I, I, didn't know, uh, I didn't know. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't know you have to act, be worried about. There's another thing to be worried about. <laughs> um, I didn't know that they were that prevalent I mean, I, there too. Yeah, we have them in a, in a we have them in a little patch of southern Ohio. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't know there. I mean, they're they're all over the south now yeah um is that will, will they like go after people yeah oh absolutely yeah i actually had one bluff charge me what I really around, yeah because the way that i was on the i think cucumber trail or something like that so i was coming around this curve and it kind of zigzags out of the fingers of this ridge and i'm going kind of fast so i'm just kind of going through here and i come around the curve and there they are like right on trail and there's there's kind of like a drop off. So there's no place for me to go here. There's no trees for me to climb. And I'm probably 12, 15 feet from this hog. And it, it was a big one. It was probably, uh, it had to, it had to weigh a couple hundred pounds. I mean, it was a big one. And I remember just looking at it and trying not to like make direct eye contact, just kind of keep my head low and just slowly back up. But man, that hair on that thing just went straight up and started snorting. I had these tusks. Oh, I wow. I was a dead man. <laughs> oh, wow. But fortunately, it took off the other way. But I can't tell you how many how many times I've run into like 20 or 30 hogs at one time. What? And <laughs> yeah. And then on the North Carolina side, I was on the Hazel Creek Trail. Just before dusk, I was getting ready to go to my campsite during the last 900. And I came across this big hog. I mean, it was the biggest one I'd ever seen. I know these are almost like fish stories, so we can like <laughs> we so yeah, right. this hog was the size of a Volkswagen. Jeez. You know, it just seemed oh. like it was that big, you know, in the woods. Yeah. Uh, probably just because I was way too close. Yeah. But this thing was like in the middle of the trail and he got pissed off at me and snorted and squealed and took off down the trail. The same direction I'm going, I'm thinking, great. <laughs> you know, how far is he going to go? Sure enough, he only went like a few hundred yards. Or less than 100 yards. But I come over this hill, and there he is again. He gets mad, does his whole routine, goes in the same direction. And we play this little dance Mm -hmm. probably two or three times before he gets mad enough, and he goes up the mountain. And it sounded like he was just destroying the rhododendron as he was bulldozing his way up there. He was not happy. But, yeah, I'm more worried about hogs than I am actual bears. And actually – I used to carry like some canine mace spray with yeah. me for the bears. I don't even bother, you know, because if I was going to have to use that on the hog, the hog would use that as a breath mint <laughs> <laughs> as he's chomping down on me. You're, uh, we, we've talked to a lot of people about crazy animal interactions. Mm-hmm. You're the first wild boar, <laughs> wild boar guest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't yeah, know. There's that. all kinds in this area, especially East Tennessee, North Carolina. Um, I mean, they'll they'll just destroy yeah. the whole area. It looks like someone came in with the rototiller and yeah, just tilled it up. I wonder if they pushed like the bear population out or around. Or Do something. bears eat them? No, no. Most of your bears in the Smokies just eat plants, grubs, things like yeah. that. Mm-hmm. May maybe a small rodent. You know, you typically the bear attacks that you've seen in the Smokies are either you've gotten too close to the cubs. Yeah. Or you went, you decided to eat your dinner while you were in bed. Right. So now you smell like your dinner. Ah, uh, yes. So that that's really in the end. I mean, because bears don't like target people. In fact, my two bears that I've seen during my first 900, one was coming around down the AT, like you're approaching Shook Stack as you're entering the park going northbound. And I was going northbound, and this bear is coming southbound. And I seen him way out, and I thought. Maybe if I just slide off the trail a little bit, and just sit here quietly, I can capture him going by. Mm. Keep in mind, I would have been within about six to eight feet of this bear. Yeah, I'm not by. doing that. So I'm thinking about it, and then I'm thinking about all the hate mail I would get. Yes. Attempting <laughs> such a thing. Yeah. So I thought, no, I'm just going to let him know. So I hollered at him, and he just stopped, and he's like, I heard something. What was it? And then I like waving my arms at him 
and yell again, he looks, and he's like, oh, crap. And he heads up the mountain again just as fast as he could go. Wow. And that's the typical black bear response mm-hmm. that you're going to get from the Smokies. You know, they're going to hightail and go the other direction. If you want really close bear encounters, go Don't. to Gatlinburg. Yeah, see, <laughs> oh, so yeah, I've, yeah, yeah. I've been to Gatlinburg, and the only hiking and backpacking I've done in the Smokies is in the Gatlinburg area, and they're everywhere. So that's why yeah. I was like, a smoke, 900 miles of Smokies, you had to have tons tons of black bears, but it sounds like they're just yeah. hyper-concentrated in the they, Gatlinburg area. They all live in Gatlinburg. <laughs> <laughs> they all have Tom shares in Gatlinburg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, what, um, so you've done doing these FKTs. This is something we also talked about on a couple of our live streams. Um, you do a lot of this stuff solo. Have you had any like really creepy things happen? People always ask this question. Um, I stayed at a campsite, uh, where someone had actually been pulled out of their hammock by a bear. Oh, um, yeah, like within like a year, and I stayed at the same campsite. Uh, I remember I that. Remember Is that North Carolina? Waking, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was in the Hazel Creek area. I remember when that happened. Uh, and I remember staying at that and somewhat being, I don't know, I felt like something was messing with me in the middle yeah. of the night, but I yeah. was so tired. I couldn't like, you know how you have those dreams where you can't make yourself wake up? Right. Yeah, 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 it's yeah, like yeah. you try to scream, but you're just too tired or whatever it is. So I don't know if this is really a dream or what. But I felt like something was messing with my tent. And I remember just trying to muster up enough lung power to say a word or get something out of my mouth just because you're so tired, you're scared yeah. of whatever is going on in your head in that half-sleep state. And I went back to sleep. Uh, the next morning, my head tie-out on that wall was undone and laying on the ground. So something had definitely messed with it in the middle of the night. So I, I figured maybe hogs or maybe a bear tripped over it or something. Okay. Uh, but either way, I was too tired to wake up. <laughs> that's pretty creepy. Yeah, it was like something like walking around the tent and like tripped up on it. Uh, yeah, that's freaky. That's freaky. Yeah. Um, do you do you like do you prefer solo backpacking? Some people do. <sighs> I do. I do for some things. I, I really do. I mean, even with my 900 miles, I had friends that would hike yeah, with me a mm-hmm. day here or a day there. Yeah. Cause I've got friends, you know, that can do 20 and 30 miles. So, you know, they were good. Um, it wasn't until like Thanksgiving day and the last day that, the, you know, the person that hiked with me on the very last day couldn't do no more than 10 miles. Mm-hmm. So that was my max mileage for that day. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the most part, I hike, you know, I enjoy those alone hikes, those times that you can kind of go through and clean off your desk. You yeah, know, you guys yeah. probably heard me talk about it. It's like all the right. clutter that yeah, you have in yeah. your brain. I, I, I compare it to like a desk and everybody's desk is piled up. Mm-hmm. And whenever I'm out there hiking solo, I can pull one of those images of traumatic rescue scenes that I've worked yeah. on or just different traumatic things I've dealt with in my life and I can just kind of deal with some of that you know maybe try to get my brain to file it where it goes you know to not just lay there on top of my desk put it back in the memory where it belongs instead of just constantly just haunting me and you know you try to go through some of those those things but at the same time I enjoy hiking with you know like my my close friends you know i gone to some amazing places you yeah. know, scotland you yeah. know turkey you know paris and I, I even enjoy urban hiking you know it's where you're just hiking all over the city you know we'll do 20 miles easily oh wow um, around paris copenhagen you know london whatever um it's really easy to like pack on those miles too and you have different opportunities for photography for videography yeah. in those areas especially when you're hiking old cities like Edinburgh or Glasgow, you know, you're, you're getting, you're getting a chance to see some areas that, you know, you may never get to see again. Yeah. But, but I enjoy hiking with my close friends because you get to share those moments. You get to see the expression on their face and, and they can tell if, you know, something's bothering you. Just like whenever we were in Turkey, um, details, I mean, we were hiking along in details and those me more, probably more than anybody. 
And at the time I was going through, um, you know, going through a divorce and different things like that. And uh, it was just something, you know, I had a lot of junk on my mind. I was fighting off depression with everything I could muster. I was trying to enjoy everything around me. You know, you're also like battling off PTS from like trying to take over. And you're just, you're in the middle of all these things going on mentally inside of you. So it's hard to like really focus. Like I have the Apple tower in front of me yeah. and I'm in Paris. It's like, how, how more cool is that? But yet you're fighting off, you know, something that's trying to steal your joy. And, um, I remember him just looking over at me a few times and he could see it and he would just grab me by the neck, you know, and put his arm around me and goes, can you believe we're in Paris, you know, or can you believe we're in Istanbul? Yeah. You know, just on these epic adventures, yeah. just trying to get me to snap out of it a little bit. It's like, Hey, I know you're, I know you're fighting this, but look at what you're around, what's surrounding you. Right. You know, yeah. we love you. You know, we're, we're here to support you. So that just really meant a lot. You know, and him and I, we've had a lot of conversations since about that. And, and um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate him for noticing that. And even whenever I was out in Arizona, uh, out there doing some hiking with Darwin, uh, you know, I can't say enough about him. You know, he, he sensed that same thing in, yeah. in December whenever all that was fresh with me. And, um, you know, just, just kind of reminded me, that, hey, you know, you're surrounded by people that love you. You know, you're not alone because in those moments you feel like you're alone, like you're on a desert island. But in, in reality, you're not. You know, so many other people are fighting off different things or dealing with stuff. And, you know, sometimes people just need a little break. You know? and, and that's a that is a um, that's a theme for like a lot of people when they when they go on like 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 long distance through hikes or or. um you know, when you watch like these daily vlogs of people doing like the AT or the PCT or something, a lot of conversations around like trying to work through serious mm -hmm. issues that they've mm -hmm. that they've been dealing with and in um, yeah. trying to to confront those. And, and I think like one of the uh, I don't I don't know if you follow Ivy Tata at, at all, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. I, I spoke to him a few times, met him a few times. Oh, okay. cool! Good guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One one of the things that uh, struck me is on on his PC one of one of the vlogs on his PCT. Uh, he was in like Oregon or Washington or something, and he and he he had this. Uh, he said this thing that I think struck a lot of people. That's like, you know, I think the exact words is "we'll keep we'll keep hiking, we'll keep healing," and that seems to be a a trend that like a lot of people, you know. Are, are, yeah, trying to, um, are trying to work through and there's yeah. a, there's a guy on instagram we follow todd insta life yeah todd yeah. shout out to todd um he's a nurse and he 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 talks openly you know about ptsd from he's yeah. a trauma nurse i think yeah emergency yeah. nurse um but he does a lot of backpacking and hiking and that's also his yeah. like way to heal you know so it seems like that's a good strategy well, you know, yeah, I think it. I think it takes some of the noise away from. I like everyday the decluttering life. the desk yeah. analogy. I liked that one. Yeah, yeah. that's really yeah, that's good. Really yeah, that's really the the best way I've ever been able to describe it to anybody. Um, because your brain just works in such a funny way. You know, obviously, I was an EMT, firefighter, rescue mm -hmm. diver for well over a decade. Uh, taught swift water rescue. Was on the state swift water rescue team uh, for a pretty good while as well, and. You know, during that time, you see a lot of stuff. Yeah. You know, you, you see a lot of horrific vehicle accidents. You see gunshot wounds. You see unexplainable deaths. You see a lot of drownings. And unfortunately, you know, that's par for the job. And I stumbled back into hiking and didn't realize it, but hiking was healing me a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, I had someone in my life uh, during, you know, during the last, you know, probably six, seven years or so that triggered me, you know, that, that would just trigger everything into motion. And once triggered, it's almost like you're hanging on like a violent roller coaster ride, like a wooden roller coaster ride. But then all you're seeing is just all this traumatic scenes just flashing and uh, you just can't get away from it. It's like a nightmare that keeps chasing you. That almost like a groundhog day situation where it's just over and over and over. And, um, 
so I stumbled back into hiking to kind of I kind of figured out, okay, this is helping me a little bit. I'm not triggered quite, quite so easily. And uh, in 2019, I had a lot of injuries, so I didn't get to hike that much. I did the TGO challenge, but outside that, right. that was it. And um, so I stayed home a lot, and I was like triggered like almost every other week, and they kept getting more and more violent. And um, I was seeking help. I was trying, you know, I was going to the therapist and different things like that. And nothing was really working. And then I stumbled across Reboot Recovery. And Reboot Recovery actually worked for me. You know, I went to my first um, course, my first class on October 7th. My last episode was October 8th. Today wow. is 217 days PTS episode free. That's awesome. And I contribute, number one, you know, hiking has played a big, huge part of that healing. Their uh, trauma healing course has filled in those other gaps. And then my faith has filled in even more gaps. The way I look at it, it's like having a glass mason jar. You throw in a bunch of like one-inch marbles in there all the way to the top. You think your jar is full, but it's not. You have all those little cracks and crevices. Mm. So you throw in reboot recovery in this jar, which represents maybe maybe small uh, eighth-inch pebbles. So it's filling in all those little cracks. You think your jar is full, right? No, it's, you still have spaces in there. Then you take faith as fine-grained silicate sand, you throw in that jar, and it fills in even more, more stuff. Now your jar is full. So it took all those elements, all those components for me to get to where I am today. And without my faith, without reboot, without hiking, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be standing here, you know, 217 days. You know, I know for a fact in December, there's no fact, no doubt in my mind that I would have been triggered easily. Hands down, that would have happened. Um, um, just because my situation here was just so toxic. And, um, you know, I was able to, number one, recognize my trigger. Number two, uh, learn better coping mechanisms and, and learn how to deal with that trauma and deal with this and line up to where and to control my sponsor, responses to the things that were hurting me. And I didn't have to respond with pain. I didn't have to respond with hurtful words or yelling or arguing or anything of that nature. Where I didn't have to go sleep in my truck for a couple of days because I get so worked up that I can't be around people. I can't be around myself. You know, I just need total darkness, total silence for at least 48 hours. And, you know, I praise God I'm not having to do that now. You know, I'm here, here in my own house. It's peaceful. It's quiet. Yeah. And um, just me and my daughter. And I, I, I appreciate, you know, just having this one-on-one -on -one time with her and just being a parent. Um, I've seen you talk on Instagram a lot about reboot recovery. What mm -hmm. is, um, and it's not something I know anything about. What is, what is specific about that? That is so helpful. Well, reboot recovery is a nonprofit organization based out of middle Tennessee and they assist military veterans, first responders and their families that are coping with mental traumas like PTS. Um, PTS being post-traumatic stress, I prefer not to call it PTSD because it's really not a disorder. Yeah. It's really an injury, an injury to the brain and an injury to your soul. If you really dig deep, if you really want to know why you have paramedics or you have um, people in the military that go in for the the best reasons in the world. They want to help people. They want to make a difference. And then by the end of their careers, they don't care if they stripe you down on the gurney or not. Just get in my bus. You know, they just have like poor attitudes. They just want to go home. You know, they're, they're dealing with divorce left and right because their spouses don't even know who they are yeah. because they've changed. And then that change can only happen when there's injury to the brain and injury to the soul. I mean, so these people are changing on a like deeper level, just not an outer, just not something as simple as, as just the brain. So, but the reboot makes this free to everybody who comes cool. and participates. It's free. 
they will provide free childcare and wow. they feed you. So there's no reason why you can't go. And Reboot Recovery has saved so many marriages, saved so many lives. I mean, for me, I found Reboot Recovery a little bit too late to save my marriage. And, um, and, and you know, my wife just simply did not understand PTS. You know, and, and it's hard for someone to, to live with or deal with or whatever if they don't understand it. They don't take that time to learn you know, or have that initiative to want to make that marriage work or whatever. But Reboot Recovery is amazing. It's a complete godsend. Uh, their courses are faith-based, so they're biblically based. Mm-hmm. And that kind of helps back up, you know, a lot of the things that we use for healing backed up with scripture. And, you know, whenever you're fighting something, whenever you're struggling, whenever you're down, whenever you're just clinging on to just anything most people turn to faith you know you got to have faith in something no matter what religion uh you choose you got to have a faith in something and and uh and reboot is no different their, their courses are faith-based and uh for me i'm a follower of christ which lines up with reboots you know courses and stuff like that so i made it like really easy very really similar or familiar for me because uh, a lot of teachings I already knew, I just didn't know to apply them or, or how to understand them on a deeper level. But, you know, I, I I can't think Reboot enough. I mean, those people, and it's not taught by instructors or just professional instructors. These are like fellow first responders, yeah. you know, fellow veterans who are just, they've gone through it. You know, they're they're struggling with PTS. They're dealing with it. They've gone through these classes just like I am. And now I teach as well. I'm also a leader in, in the first responder courses. Oh, nice. So I've gone from just as a student to an instructor. And as part of these, you're also building up community. You know, you're building up fellow first responders that are struggling. And, you know, things happen out of nowhere and you don't have anywhere to turn or than someone that you know is going to understand what you're dealing with. I, you can't just turn to a regular therapist because yeah. they've never struggled with PTS. Yeah. They don't know. They'll, they'll tell you how to fix it, but they really don't know. So that's why Reboot, that's why Re- Reboot is different. These people know. They've dealt with it. Yeah, and I, I think that the, uh, the, the sense of community with whatever – what, whatever you're trying to heal from is, is generally like a, a factor that can play extremely positively yeah. into that. And so I've seen like a lot of different types of healing based on like community. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, just, just sharing commonality helps by itself. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. I mean, last night I graduated from my fourth reboot class. Oh, nice. And then in, in two weeks I'll graduate from another one because I, tend to do a couple of different classes at, at the same time. They're just kind of staggered by a few weeks. But, you know, I do that to not only support my fellow leaders, you know, because I also help teach those classes too from time to time, but also just to kind of help, you know, the fellow participant. Because people that are new to the program, that are new coming in, they're quiet, they're they're really shy. They don't know what they're getting into. They, you know, they're at the end of the rope. Now, a lot of these people have already tried to commit suicide, have, you know, maybe been on medication for God knows how long or whatever. They just need to know someone in the room has been where they're at and they need to see where they will be if they assert themselves. And I'm there just to show that, hey, the program works. Number one, you know, you're going to get out of it what you put into it. And, you know, unfortunately, part of the program is you got to share your story. Yeah. And for me, which was kind of easy because I've been sharing my story ever since I've been able to, you know, really figure out I was, I had PTS and, you know, having social media, I just felt this strong desire to, you know, kind of give back, maybe help that one person that is afraid to talk about it, afraid to go to a course like that, afraid to, 
be publicly shamed or whatever, whatever they feel, or maybe even be demoted. Unfortunately, in the first responder field, if I'm an EMT nowadays, if I was an EMT and I went to my supervisor and I said, hey, you know, that call we just ran, you know, with that fatality, that that's messing with me a little bit. I, I don't feel good. You know, I, I'm struggling with that. They automatically pull me off the truck and put me behind a desk mm, or make yeah, me wow. or make me stay home for a certain period yeah. of time. I mean, how's that helping me? Right, right. It's not right. helping me. You know, so a lot of these guys and girls, they want to even think about going to their supervisor to say, hey, I'm struggling with this. And so a lot of them end up, you know, in addiction, you know, taking pills or whatever, getting reckless behavior, you know, maybe losing their marriage, whatever the case may be, because they feel like they're all alone because they can't talk to anybody about it or they're going to lose their job. And that's where they just start in the nosedive. Wow. Yeah, that's um, that's a problem. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. And then when you think about you think about the situation that we're in right now. Yeah. And you think about like, yeah. you know, these these ground zero hospitals like in New oh York, my God. And all, these, all these healthcare workers that and and I know that there's talks around like trying to trying to put put things in place to assist them after this is all done, but this is like you know, when the country goes back to normal at some point there's going to be a large group of people yeah. that do not go back to normal. Yeah. I, yeah, I didn't even think well, there's that. no, there's and, no question. And you know, what are we doing? To, some of our, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in some of our courses, I mean, we have nurses, uh, all kind of healthcare workers inside those courses that are already starting to attend these classes. And, um, I think we're going to see a huge influx of that as time goes on. I've got friends that have gone up to New York to help out. Uh, in those hospitals and things of that nature. And, you know, they've told me some of the things that they've seen and uh, I, I couldn't imagine, oh, you know, mm -hmm. witnessing, you know, death on that magnitude, you know, just vast numbers, you know, to, to the point to where your morgues are full yeah, and you've got, you know, trucks with freezers on them to store the bodies in. Right. You know, I, I couldn't imagine having to work and having to deal with that, you know, but it's a reality, you know, and all these, you know, healthcare workers are going to need our support Yep. when this is, they need our support now, but they're also going to need it whenever this is done. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think organizations like reboot recovery are going to be able to help these people uh, just kind of process what they've kind of like dealt with. They'll help them understand the, the trauma, the types of trauma, because these things bring out, Trauma has a way of just pulling other traumas out. Yeah. Like you were, you know, if you were abused as a child, you might have forgotten about it, you know, outside, out of mind, just moved on. Some of these traumas like trigger memories and all of a sudden you remember all these hurtful things that happened to you as a child or in past relationships or whatever. And you, all these tragic losses in your life all of a sudden rise to the top and you feel like you're drowning. Yeah. Um, that's so, those are wise words. I know. I know. Um, yeah. didn't mean to bring the mood. Down. No, 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 man. Super. No, no, no. This Just is, a uh, dose of reality. No, 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 this is, it's, I think it's help. It's certainly helpful for people listening. There's who are so dealing many, with there's, this there's so many people that, that struggle every um, day with this type of stuff and, and to hear, yeah. and to hear other people yeah. that go through the same thing is very important. So, yeah. No, it's, yeah. this is I real mean, life. I can, I can tell you that, you know, I'm, I'm getting a lot better as far as dealing with my traumas and things of that nature. Like I said, 217 days since my last PTS episode. So that's a victory in itself. Uh, and I do count every day because that's a small victory in a very large battle. Mm -hmm. So no matter if you're dealing with alcoholism or whatever you're dealing with, count each day that you're sober. Count each day that you go by without having to struggle with that or that you defeat that because that's one day that you can add to the victory in that very large battle. And then let's say you, you slip up and you fall and you like succumb to that. Get back up, get, get, you know, right back into the fight and you start back at day one again, but you know how far you made it before. And that's your goal to get to that and pass that. So every time 
you get a little bit further, you're carrying that ball a little bit further. If you drop it, fine. Pick it up, back up and continue to go forward. Just don't give up and say, okay, well, I had a beer. I'm, you know, I'm drunk. I'm, I'm just, that's how I'm just going to stay. Yeah. You don't have to do that. Everybody messes up. Everybody falls. Everybody fails. It's what you do afterwards. It's what counts. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, I'm, I'm, thank you. Thank you for sharing your story yeah. with us. Yeah. And, uh, thank you for being on this podcast. This was really good. I really, I yeah. really hope people listening. I one one last question. We try to keep these about. We could, we try to keep these about an hour, and so like I definitely. Yeah, no, that's fine. Man. I I definitely wanted you to talk a little bit about Highline. I know we should have talked about yeah. Highline. Yeah. I know, and and, hey. and and that's uh like I have, sorry, I haven't seen the documentary yet. Um, but I watched all. I watched. I watched. I know. I watched all the. <laughs> everybody's YouTube videos that were coming out of that trip. And it was, it was absolutely beautiful, but could you definitely talk about like uh, about the documentary and, and what you guys have been up to with it and where to, where to, where to get it? Absolutely. Well, right now Highline is available uh, for direct download. You can get it off iTunes, Amazon, Google play, Microsoft video and Vimeo. Uh, you can get those means you can get on DVD or Blu-ray. You can go through Highline, uh, Films.com, I think that's the website, um, or HighlineFilm.com or OutMersiveFilms.com, either one of those. Um, yeah, I mean, Highline is out there. Everybody's able to watch it now. Before COVID hit, we were kind of doing a media mm-hmm. tour. Yeah, program, I remember that. I'm receiving Showing it all. All the REIs were, were starting to pick it up, mm-hmm. and I was going to all these down here in the south, traveling everywhere, you know, just showing it, making new friends. Um, that was really cool, but, uh, COVID hit. So that all shut down. We were able to get it released a little bit earlier than what we planned. And so far the response has been really good. A lot of people are liking it. A lot of people are, are finding encouragement through it. You know, it is a good hiking video, uh, but it also has a lot of just a lot of history about the high line that you went to mountains and the local area there in utah but it also tells the stories of five hikers and these five friends of how how they're kind of connected in a little different ways and all of them come from different backgrounds and different experiences and as you watch the film each story gets more and more dramatic and when when we were making this film chris told me that my story was going to be the last one Mm -hmm. And I was like, so how jacked up as my story? <laughs> that is like really bad. Uh, come to find out my story is really messed up, but it has like, it has a great, great ending. Um, but yeah, you know, it was a great, great hike to do. I really enjoyed it. You went to the mountains were just amazing. Yeah. I had just come from the JMT. So mm-hmm. I just come straight yeah. to Utah from California and, I tell you, I was just floored. I wasn't expecting Utah because I've never been to Utah, so I didn't have no idea what to expect. But it was absolutely stunning, absolutely breathtaking. And um, I can't wait to go back. You know, I'm hoping maybe maybe this winter, maybe go back and do a little bit of ice fishing. Oh, and, nice. Um, Get some trout. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because when we were out there for the world premiere in Vernal, you know, there are a lot of people out on the lakes, ice fishing, and I've never done that before in my life. And uh, I was talking to a few people, a few locals who invited me back, and uh, talking to Devin that does the Backpacking yeah. Experience podcast. Mm-hmm. And he invited me over to do some ice fishing, so I've got to do it. I mean, I have to like <laughs> to do, do that. It. And I have a yeah, and I actually have a friend. Uh, I guess you could say a friend. Uh, she's more of a follower. That's over in Utah, and she's actually a river guide. Oh, cool! So, so I want to try to do some fly fishing. I would love to do another trip out there where I could do some fly fishing mm-hmm. and all that, and just kind of learn that skill a little bit better than what I know it. Yeah, well, Devin's Which becoming I don't a pro really know at it. Like that much. Yeah, you got De- Devin. Will, yeah, he's he's doing that a lot. Yeah, he's getting good. Yeah, yeah. Um, we nice. will we will put links to Highline everything in the description of this video too. Mm-hmm. So please check that out. Yeah. Um, all right, sir. Thank you so much, man. Yeah. This is fun. No, this was very, very educational yeah. and important. So I appreciate you, you, you know, enlightening us and, and educating us on, on 
on your situation yeah and, and and just showing how important like mental health is especially right now for sure yeah especially right now oh, yeah. oh it's tremendous and i, I yeah. couldn't imagine especially right now where they're asking us to stay home yeah. right you know i have so many friends that are like losing their minds because they don't have anything to do um and i mean personally here i'm actually in my gym area mm -hmm. so i've been hitting the gym a lot nice. almost every day of the week and if i can i there's like a gravel trail not too far from my house i'll get my bike out and ride my bike on that yeah. or i live one mile from the lake so i'll go down down on the lake bank and just do a little fishing nice mm -hmm. um you know try to try to stay away from everybody and do things like that but also try to just get that vitamin yeah. d yeah yeah try to be outside i've already done all the yard work i can do <laughs> I've already chores. my house a million different ways. <laughs> so what else is there to do right um well you stay safe sir okay always um always. all right man thank you so much for talking to yeah, us yeah thanks appreciate all it all right y'all take care i really yeah. appreciate it yeah. yeah thanks see ya Bye.